So, for all intents and purposes, this is the final dungeon of um, uh, Final Fantasy VII Remake. We are in the Drum, which is Hojo's Genova Research Laboratory in Shinra Tower, uh, which we never saw in the original game. May or may not have existed there. But um, essentially, the entire place exists to give context to some of the weird-ass fucking monsters that could appear in random battles during the very short section between getting out of your cell and getting to President Shinra's headquarters. Oh, yeah. You probably missed most of the monsters in that area, but they were all very strange and very memorable. And uh, now they have a place to actually exist. So, um... <laughs> well, you see, you started in encountering those uh, creatures after the, the trail of blood on the floor when Genoa was, was broken out. I, I always took them as escaped experiments. Well, yeah, that's basically what they were, but they didn't... The story didn't really tell you that. Yeah, there wasn't... I mean, but you don't. You didn't have to be blatantly told that, though. I think it's just environmental. Story. I know, but at the same time, like, the only place that the game ever showed anything escaping from was Genova's tank. <laughs> um, right. And there wasn't anything, like, connected to it. There wasn't any other environmental damage. You just... You just saw this scene, and then for a short couple of screens, you could encounter these monsters and random battles along the way. No one ever remarked on them or anything. There was no, there was no comment by Hojo or anyone from Shinra that things had escaped on the science floor. It was just... I forgot to steal my hard edge from the third-class soldiers, and they're not showing up anymore. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. It, it's just like, you know, it, it's an odd note in the opening of Final Fantasy VII that, you know, makes sense when you think about it, but it also makes a lot more sense now that they have their own section. And this entire sequence also, in, also gives the party a little bit more time to interact directly with Hojo himself. Because Hojo yeah, is actively well, running. Hojo and you don't you also get some time to actually interact with Red 13 before you just go, okay, we're out of time to get a motorcycle and get out of here. <laughs> that too, yes. Can you drive stick? What? He, I don't think he can even... He, <laughs> he has he has paws. I don't know if he can drive, period. You can pull well, a lever. Well, I mean, I mean, Barrett's right hand is missing, so good luck with him driving a stick. It is, it is interesting that we had a, that we have some, some time to interact with Red 13 here, because in the original story, Red 13 was very much distant from the rest of the party up until Cosmo Canyon, which... Obviously isn't going to happen for a little while. Anyway, Moth Unit. Uh, these guys, I remember these guys from the original. But here's the thing. That entire s circling blade there counts as a physical attack while it's active. So if you just stay yeah. in Punisher stay, mode and yeah. hold the block and button, next to it, yeah. <laughs> every time this fucker gets up next to you, you, you just automatically counterattack. Um, and it gets even better once you get Cloud's uh, next sword, like two rooms away from here, where you can mix in the counter stance ability too. <laughs> it's a nice little, uh, nice little way of dealing with the enemies because I, I I didn't realize the the spinning desk was always like always just counts as a physical attack. I just thought it was just something inherently tied to the moth unit because <laughs> I thought these guys were I, I thought these guys were magic. <laughs> uh, Are they on weak the road. to fire? Uh, the weak delight. The weak delight. Ah, uh, flavor fail. Okay, look. Flavor fail. They, they're Damn. supposed to be like a moth to a flame. I, I'd call your I'd, I'd call your restaurant something else, Ted. What? <laughs> <laughs> now. Good job, Barrett. <laughs> once you realize the trick to dealing with the moth units, they become a bit of a joke. Um. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, they are by far not the most annoying enemy that you're going to be fighting in this section. There are a few random enemies from the original game that got upgraded to boss status. And of course, some of those weird um, mutant uh, experiment monsters from the other underground lab are in here too. So we have those enemies mixed in with the bunch. But by and far, the most annoying enemy that you will fight in this area is the fucking whack-a-mole robot. Excuse me? <laughs> the fucking <laughs> whack-a-mole robot. robot. I might be the only guy here, or anyone else in this circle of 
in this circle is that had the 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 the, the worst encounter was the fucking six dogs in that one room with Terra. Uh, oh, okay. the, the bloodhounds. Okay, <laughs> those things can fuck you up pretty fast. But if like me, you've already gained planets protection for Aerith. Um, as long right. as you like. St- which I did Stay not. alive for 20 seconds. Eventually, she'll hit her limit break, and then the dogs can't touch you. So <laughs> well, That's easy. Just survive and pray. Well, Just be you, good I at mean, video games. You say that as a joke, John, but pray is a good healing skill in this right. game. It is a good way to yeah, survive. Yeah. Um, I, I, did, I, I mean, I, I didn't have trouble with pretty much anything else except that room, but everybody else had no problem with that room. <laughs> I remember other, other people. I remember specifically there was an article complaining about how much of a difficulty spike the dogs were. I didn't and have I no problems with it whatsoever. I didn't have trouble with the dogs, but they can do a lot of damage very quickly. So if you're not on your toes, it can kill you pretty Final fast. Final weapon of the game. All right, yeah. T- the okay, that thing stinger. looks really dumb to me for some reason. <laughs> it kind of does. Uh, I'm just going to use it long enough to get Counter Stance. Counter Stance is one of Cloud's most useful abilities in that... When you know how to use it, right? Yeah. Counter Stance, it give, basically it gives you another opportuni- another way to trigger a counter attack when an enemy, when an enemy uh, hits you with a physical attack. It can be used regardless of what stance Cloud is in. And because it's an ATB skill, it can cancel out attack animations. So Counter Stance now uh, gives you a way to cancel into a counter when you're in the middle of a combo, which is... It also changes the stance you're currently in. So if you're in operator mode, it'll switch you to punisher mode and vice versa, which means... If you do that, cancel because an enemy is going to do an attack on you, and then that counter stance triggers their uh, their uh, you know completely uh, helpless state. It just puts you right into Punisher, and you can just whack them. Are you sure that's um? Are you sure that's not disorder you're thinking of? Oh, it might be disorder. Sorry. Yeah, disorder does the uh, the stance change. Counter stance just uh, it lets you do a pretty big counter. Um, I think. It also counters multiple times if you get hit multiple times during its animation. So uh, that's a thing to keep in mind. I'm, but, I'm still caught up on the design of that sword because I'm thinking in any other game that would look cool. But something about it being like in Final Fantasy 7 <laughs> makes it look stupid and dumb to me. Speaking of it looking stupid and dumb, if you're still using it during the final boss with Sephiroth, there are a few cutscene moments where they lock swords. And because of the shape of Twin Stink, oh, is Stinger, it just is it on like the the part that doesn't technically exist? <laughs> no, it, no he, he, they lock swords below the Twin Stinger's hilt. Um, oh so, god! <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> so it's like the one place where you wouldn't want to do that. Um, I, so. I guess it's just how curvy it looks. A lot of the stuff in Final Fantasy VII, even after you get out of Midgar, is very industrial looking in terms of the weapons and monsters and all that stuff. Well. It's not it's not like Cloud didn't have swords in the original game that just screamed fantasy at you. But um yeah, I get what well, you're saying. Well, each individual weapon in this game feels more big deal because there's only like 6 of them. Um, yeah. you know. Uh, well, they don't want to give you a bajillion weapons for a game where you barely have the time to use the ones they give you in this game. Twin Stinger, its name suggests that it's meant to resemble something like an insect stinger or something, but um, I'm not really sure. In any case, I generally just stick with the Buster Sword with Cloud because much like Lightning in Final Fantasy 13, Cloud does his best work as a well-rounder. Um, so the first weapon, which is always the well-rounded weapon, tends to be the best fit for any situation. Um, whereas the other swords all have like a very specific bent that uh, I feel the main character doesn't necessarily need to lean into because you have party members that can lean into that stuff. Wait a minute, why don't we just use our super grappling hook thing we used to climb the... the... We don't have it anymore. Why not? Remember, Barrett dropped his on the way up, and then that's... You can't can't use one for four people. (laughs) Okay, but they're above. Just drop it down. (laughs) I mean, you gotta put lands in the right spot. Dude, these people are physical... These people can jump up 30 feet in the air anyway. Well, Cloud can. Tifa jumps pretty damn high, too. 
I'm pretty sure Tiva could do it. Yeah, not Baron. Though. Baron and Aerith, no, no. I like no. the uh, the communications terminals that you use to switch between the two parties are called PHS terminals. Yeah, yeah. I love a little touch too. <laughs> what is that supposed to stand for? The PHS was, was the, the game, was the so. mobile phone that you used to keep in contact with your other party members. So it oh, was okay. your party. It was your party help system or something. Um, in any case, the drum, which has been slightly wrecked by Sephiroth, but only slightly, is uh, essentially it's designed to look a lot like the Genova experiment facility in the reactor in Nibelheim, but it's also, like, infinitely larger. <laughs> um, it's, like, multiple floors high, so you have to uh, assume Shinra has given, like, multiple floors of headquarters to Hojo for this purpose. It's also right below the president's floor, so it's, like... Okay, wow. <laughs> How'd you miss that? <laughs> I don't also, know if uh, I'd so, want so, my so, so office what, right on top of the dangerous science lab. That's just I would, assu- I would assume. I would assume President Shinner also kind of lives here, so it's like, how does he go to sleep knowing there's like monsters like one floor down? Does it? Does he like make lots of noise and he just bangs on the floor? Shut up, you. <laughs> it might be more of a coincidence, but it also in some way reminds me of the final part of the Northern Crater, where you're going down that spiral, fighting down the Iron Giants and the Zombie Dragons, and it ends with the Battle of Genova. Oh, yeah. I think I, I think I get what you mean, but um, that's what I'm saying. I, I, th- I think that just might be more of a coincidence, but I, I was reminded of that. Be mm. we will. Only in this case, we're trying to make our way up, really. Yeah. Roger that. In any case, um, this is one of those dungeons that I like in Final Fantasy, where you've got two distinct parties that you're it's switching between to get okay. things done. I always, I, I've always had a soft spot for these kind of dungeons: Final Fantasy VI, Final Fantasy VIII. Um, it's just like all of your characters, in theory, will get something to do. All right, we need to fight. We need the final boss. All right, let's launch a full final slot. No, no, no. We're only bringing four people with us. The rest of you are going to sit on the ship. <laughs> what? <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, Casey. You just haven't gotten your limit break high enough. You're just not useful. But I want to help. No, you're sitting on the high wind. That having been said, given the nature of this location, a lot of it is channeling the spirit of Resident Evil pretty hard. Um... <laughs> With the piano soundtrack, <laughs> random science experience, the music, oh, the envi- the music and the environment are one thing, but for this Tifa section in particular, you have a lot of like um, creepy moments where you walk into a room full of empty dog kennels, and you're trying. I mean, Aerith would definitely be Jill. Tifa would totally be Chris punching boulders. <laughs> <laughs> and the and the characters are trying to figure out what the area is for, and then suddenly there's a bloodhound barking at you through the uh, bars. Yeah. You gotta get like a little, you gotta get a little projector with Sephiroth wearing something. I mean, I, 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 I compare that to Resident <laughs> Evil, but there's literally a room like that in Resident Evil 2 Remake, which I, mean, wh- I hope that's not Cloud's blood. <laughs> came out Sephiroth like pretty is much right enough this. in this game to basically be Wesker, and now I'm just, I'm just imagining Sephiroth with his hair slicked back, but it's still that long, <laughs> and also blonde, and he's oh wearing sunglasses, God. and also the lab coat, you know, because. <laughs> He's a scientist, don't you know? Cloud, Cloud, just starts, Cloud just starts laughing at Genova Monster, and I was like, stop that. Well, stop, he, that. stop that. Aerith, <laughs> Aerith, what are you doing? Aerith. <laughs> You're right, though. This is essentially an umbrella laboratory. Yeah, more or less. You know, you can't, you know, comparing every science area to, to Resident Evil, you just can't put all scientists under an umbrella like that. <laughs> Oh, Yuffie would totally be right. I, I, was, I was just watching Resident Evil Degeneration yesterday, and the you know, the Will Pharma lab that that the final that the final encounter takes place in in that movie is essentially in a big old circular sinkhole in the ground that doesn't look all that different from this. Is that the movie where Leon's basically a Matrix character? It, Which no, that's, that's all of them. Yeah, that's all of them. Leon um, already is a Matrix character. Have you not watched Resident Evil Four? Like he was a cheesy action hero in Resident Evil Four. And the, and the laser thing in Four was a reference to the movie more than anything else. Which is a reference to Matrix, which means he is a Matrix character. Ted in Resident Evil Degeneration, imagine Resident Evil Four Leon, except he doesn't have Resident Evil Four Leon's personality anymore. His face barely emotes at all, and he's constantly talking in this serious voice. 
That sounds like normal Resident Evil for Leon, because he's he's not Excuse really. Excuse me. <laughs> have, have, Leon snarks all the time in four. In four, I Leon never is thought all... his voice acting was great. Honestly, he was kind of. He always seemed. Look, he, I'm not saying his game. voice acting is any different. In fact, in Degeneration, he has the same fucking voice actor, but his his face is constantly angry. He barely smiles when the script calls for it, and he's constantly got this sort of stoic cool look on his face rather than what he's like in what he's like in four is he smirks he makes eye rolly faces he he says your right hand comes off when someone said when someone says they sent it the right hand. as he's talking to Ethan. Yeah. um <laughs> don't worry it gets better he, he makes stupid jokes he's 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 basically being a cocky asshole from for most of four. In, in in degeneration, they just ditch that entire aspect of his personality, but try to keep all the cool action stuff he does. So it's it's really jarring. It's like between Resident Evil Two, Resident Evil Four, and Degeneration, he had three completely distinct personalities, and it wasn't really until six that they found a happy middle ground. Um, like. In 6, he has an earnest desire to help people. That's obviously a holdover from his younger days. He makes quips and stupid jokes from time to time. Obviously, his Resident Evil 4 self's showing. But he's also been at it for a long time. So uh, he's also got this world-weary hero sort of personality going where he's just kind of tired of all the shit he's going through. (laughs) And... um, I mean, by the fifth by the fifth zombie outbreak, you would be too. Yeah. So in in Resident Evil Six, I actually quite liked his personality, but it, it felt like between Four and Degeneration, they didn't know who they wanted Leon to be. And then remake two happened, and they kind of made a younger version of what that was supposed to be. Now, I mean, maybe this is just me being a little bit less. I never thought that the characters in Resident Evil were particularly strong, but that's just... I also didn't grow up with them, so... Well, they or weren't. Or play them a lot, so that's they, just me. They weren't, but that's that's the thing. Part of the reason they weren't is because character writing consistency was kind of bad. And Leon was... Yeah, it's all over the place, you mean. And, and Leon was, like, the most <laughs> egregious, in-your-face case of that, <laughs> where he had an okay character in 2, and then he had a different but also okay character in, in 4, and then he had a different and not at all okay character in Degeneration. And they sort of merged all three of those in six to finally make a decent Leon. And um, Resident and Evil then, 2 and remake. remake 2 happened. Re- remake 2 sort of uh, tries to create a version of Resident Evil 2 Leon that could logically connect with his future selves. And for the most part, I think it succeeds. But, um, like... Uh, how, how how did we get onto this tangent? Uh, uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I compared. <laughs> I com- area, we're, okay, we, we were we were talking about how the lab reminded us of the Umbrella Lab, which went into the Resident. Yeah, yeah. I, I was just watching that movie yesterday, and this whole circular science lab showdown arena kind of reminds me of the Will Pharma Lab. Um, I mean, I'm also on a Resident Evil kick because I'm playing through eight twin lock stuff for a playthrough <laughs> for the channel eventually. I finished playing eight and then went right back to two remake. And uh, yeah, it's been fun. <laughs> to cleanse the no, no, no. I played through eight. I played through eight twice, and I had a I had a good time. And I went back to two remake because I was in a Resident Evil mood, but I figured if I played eight again, I would just get burned out. So I moved over to two. And, um, I very rarely play the same game twice in a row. It has well, to be very yeah. special for me to do. Yeah. That. Um, well, it, considering the nature of what we do, sometimes if I want to get a game out earlier, I will. But that's a different thing. All yeah. Uh, thing uh, jumping ahead a bit, the game I'm to play through that we're about to upload soon. That was immediately after I recorded for the review. <laughs> Resident Evil Eight has a good new game plus mode, though, and I'll actually. In Resident Evil 8's case, there's actually multiple weapons and crafting recipes and upgrades and stuff that just flat out don't become available until New Game Plus. So you've got some new stuff to mess around with on your second playthrough. Um, I think games like that need a New Game Plus because otherwise it's the same experience almost every time. Oh yeah, um, Resident Evil 4 had one, I think. Um, because of the, like the the breadth of the weapon upgrades system in Resident Evil 4 and by extension 8 does kind of like there's not really enough in there there's not really enough game time in one playthrough to support all of it and in fact like you don't even gain access to the final levels of weapon upgrading for stats 
until you get to um you can't upgrade the magnum at all until you do a new game plus run um you can do some magnum upgrades but you can't get the i think it's like i think it's like one power and that's about it. are we talking about village yeah yeah uh it's so fucking expensive it's likely you won't upgrade yeah though. like you might you I, like i think i got like one power upgrade for the wolf bane in my first playthrough but like none of the custom parts for the magnum become available until your second playthrough and um there's a whole second model of magnum that doesn't become available until your second playthrough yeah it's called the stake to go with the wolf bane you know there's one that's i've heard uh, i thought it was just like a piece of meat yeah um, i just ate lunch i shouldn't be this hungry <laughs> i've heard a rumor that the wolf bane magnum is more effective against the werewolves and the the stake is more effective no, against the vampires but that might just be a, that's actually not true yeah it's that's like it would make sense the, the, though the, the stake is the stake is just better yeah the wolf bane is the but one they're you not get. actually vampires the wolf bane is cooler looking the stake is better <laughs> um <laughs> i would agree medium please medium you freaking oh, we've, 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 we've this. had this conversation like six yeah, times already you're probably in this playthrough <laughs> you're wrong, you're wrong. So it's my turn? okay look like when it comes to steak yeah I'd, I'd say medium rare is kind of better but like you say we i don't want my steak breathing but didn't we but like you say we've had this conversation before weren't we actually talking about burgers which is a whole different question no we've had it about steak too have we, we underestimate yeah. our ability to go off topic <laughs> so okay. who wants some pasta <laughs> okay right where's anthony in any case this section all right this is the section where we're getting to the dogs all right so um on my first playthrough, I didn't have any trouble with the dogs. Naturally, I had trouble while recording the game. The recording curse kicked in, and then I and then I wound up having to record the whole drum again because my batch of recording footage for the drum ended up not having any audio for some reason. So um, it's actually a good thing that I had to record the drum twice because on my first run, I wound up getting like into a lot of trouble and a lot of battles throughout this area and it would have just not been very fun to watch i feel like in my second run through the drum i at least managed to show off the proper strategy for fighting a lot of the enemies but like there are a lot of enemies in the drum that can give you a lot of shit and i'm not just talking about the dogs although the dogs uh, will give you trouble because they will because th there's so many of the goddamn things and they deal so much damage so quickly their dps is through the roof yeah um so you do need to be careful in this battle um but it's not just these guys there's the the fucking poison pod things the cloud and barrett have to fight there's the the fucking whack-a-mole robots that both parties have to deal with look at look Aerith is almost dead already uh, <laughs> but like uh, there are so many enemies in here that can wreck your shit really fast, and they all have a particular, like, kind of strategy that works well against them, but, um, on my first run, I just, I, I kind of got beat up and just brute forced it, and it wasn't a particularly good showing. Like, there are so many of the bloodhounds, and if you try to hit them with fire magic or anything of that nature... Uh, they're probably going to dodge it. So your best bet here is to try and keep Aerith alive, pull out the Arcane Ward, and just Thundaga the bastards to death. Um, but, like, they also deal damage so quickly that you're almost guaranteed to hit a limit break with at least one of your characters. So if you have Planet's Protection, my uh, recommendation for how to get through this fight easily is to just keep Aerith and Tifa alive, focus on defense for a little while until Aerith hits limit break, then pull out Planet Protection, because these enemies attack exclusively with physical attacks. And if you, um, if you have the Spectral Cog, actually, which is the accessory Aerith, Aerith is using, she'll gain limit break power from using spells as well, so you can even speed things up that way. Once you've used planet protection, the goddamn dogs can't touch you. So, uh, well, at this point, you basically won the fight, and it's just a matter of... Yeah, just mow them down at yeah. this point. So just, like, go for it. Go for it. Just end them. Planet's protection lasts a fair amount of time. It's not like a super long buff. It's already a quarter of the way done at this point, but 
I think it's a minute. Yeah, it's it's a minute of pure physical invulnerability, and I think it heals you a little bit when you cast it. So uh, that's a thing. But yeah, this is a very Resident Evil section. Um, like this this entire setup is is very survival horror. They even like when you walk into the room, they force you into a few seconds of just crouch walking, while Tifa asks like, "What the hell is this place for?" You see a shit fashion room employee banging on the vending machine. <laughs> Energy drink. Actually, um, it's not actually a Shinra employee. It's actually one of the dogs dressed as a Shinra employee. Earlier in the playthrough, I said that like Final Fantasy VII had the idea to make the potions into energy drinks. I actually wasn't. I actually forgot about Final Fantasy XV. This is another Resident Evil kind of moment where your character slow down and see a monster eating a corpse. That's um, yeah. In any case, I'm just going to use this battle to use Ray of Judgment a bunch because Aerith needs to learn her weapon skills. So uh, this is going to be boring to watch. Um, I forgot about Final Fantasy XV, though, when I said that Final Fantasy VII had the idea of making potions into energy, dr energy drinks. That's actually a Final Fantasy XV thing. Um, in Final Fantasy XV, it's actually like tied up in this oddly persona-like idea where potions actually are just regular energy drinks, and it's Noctis's magic that makes them potions. <laughs> like he he has the ability to turn the energy drink into a healing elixir. <laughs> also, I, I might be misremembering, but the idea of making a potion into an energy drink, I think, it even goes as far back as like promotional tie-ins for upcoming Final Fantasy. It might be. Um, you because know, I, 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 I don't think I'm I know that Final that. Fantasy IX had a soda commercial in Japan. Oh, yeah, everybody brings up the Coke commercial for nine. It's glorious. <laughs> <laughs> it's like they wouldn't, it's like I don't think they'd come close. But like, um, until the, the ramen noodle stuff for 15. Like, Final Fantasy didn't start like implementing, uh, particularly in depth item descriptions within the world's lore until fairly late into the series where um, RPGs at large were starting to standardize that kind of thing. So it wasn't really until like really modern takes on Final Fantasy that we started getting explanations for what the hell potions and Phoenix Downs and whatever else were and how they worked. And in Final Fantasy XV's case, because the setting was going for this whole like quasi-real-world modern setting... Uh, they started to implement ideas that, like, the potions are these energy drinks and Noctis being magic uh, makes the potions heal you. Um, which is interesting and would be more interesting if Persona hadn't done that kind of thing first. <laughs> um, I mean, that that kind of stuff goes all the way back to, you know, we, we talked about Earthbound doing stuff like that, the, 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 the $300 lemonade in Pokemon. But, like, in Pokemon or in Earthbound, like, there's no explanation for why the food items heal you. They just do. In Persona, what happens is, like, the mental powers that come with having a Persona give regular everyday items some special abilities while you're using them inside the weird mind world places. So regular medicine that you buy at a pharmacy can heal you, or drinks can heal your spiritual power, that kind of thing. Um, it's something that, like, if you talk to, like, Akihiko in the, in the Persona 3 dormitory, he'll comment on it. Um, it's, it's just an in-universe explanation for why all these regular-ass things have so much use and why you should collect them all. But, like... Um, I bring this up in particular because Final Fantasy XIII... And 13-2 both had this really an obnoxious uh, tendency to rip off Persona really blatantly. <laughs> um, like, in the way the Eidolons or Espers or whatever they called them in that game worked. They were basically Personas. And then um, in 13-2, you were capturing monsters as crystals and using them as third-party members. And it was so Shin Megami Tensei that it was, uh, that it was kind of funny. Um... Well, all right. Well, correct me if I'm wrong, but the personas in, in in their series of games is basically you summon a manifestation of yourself of some capacity or whatever the tarot yes. card. Would. I don't I don't know how persona works. Yes. It, if it's not clear at that point, and you 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 all, you issue them commands, yes. right? Yeah. Then wouldn't you uh, wouldn't it be more accurate to say like they've been doing that since ten? Because in ten you control. Oh, I'm not saying that like the summons too. themselves were um 
were like rips, ripoffs of Persona, more like the scene where the summons in 13 come to you. You The, the characters mm. have this inner conflict that they start yelling about or something. And then the, 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 the fucking uh, Eidolon shows up to challenge them to Mortal Kombat as if like – as if it's that scene in Persona 4 where the where the character yells "You're not me" to their own shadow, and the boss fight starts. It was Listen, very very it, Persona. It's, it's, 4. it's very <laughs> easy to make fun of the writing in Final Fantasy 13, but can we talk about how like they screwed it up so bad that like this is supposed to be like your biggest like emotional breakdown that you've had ever since you become a Lissy or whatever, and instead of hopes um thing happening like when he tries and can't kill snow instead it just happens randomly on the plane where he's just angry that he sucks like... yeah yeah you know I, I i never understood why uh why hope's uh idolin scene happens so far toward the end of the game it's it's, it's just like kind of it, it absolutely should happen when he feels like he he's gonna try to kill snow but he can't do it like that's his biggest emotional moment in the entire freaking story and instead it's just like i suck and i haven't gotten my idolin yet and we need to have it so that every character has one ah! yeah they kind of just like realized really late into the game that they forgot to give hope a, an idolin scene uh so yeah there's an uncanny hope uh impression though to... oh <laughs> you mean just me being whiny and annoying well that's just how i am all the time but thanks i guess Hope is so weird throughout the trilogy. Like, he has character arcs, but they constantly drop them and forget about them. For the entire uh, third game, he gets turned back into a kid and also has all of his emo stri emotions stripped away, which was like half the point of him being a kid in the first place. So I, I don't understand what they were doing, what they were going for. And focus that. test groups like the kid Hope a lot more. So um, I'll make him a kid again. Uh, he kind of grew focus up. Focus test groups liked kid hopes design a lot more but they also liked adult hopes attitude a lot more so they decided to merge the two um <laughs> so i don't know um huh. maybe designing video games by committee isn't a great idea <laughs> what was that I, so final like fantasy 13 group. was a huge like uh a melting pot of missed opportunities and uh, one day we're gonna have to do the entire trilogy just to comment on all the all, no, on all the development. Wait, wait, did you hear that? I'm no. sorry, Lewis, you're breaking. There was at least enough development hell to comment on to run through at least half of the first. No, I can't hear him. Game. Anyone else can hear him? <laughs> I can't hear what he's saying. Poor Lewis. I know, right? Dropped off right at the end of the commentary. Uh, I am gonna record it someday, though.